Welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for our first a uh, gathering of the GHEX, which is the Global Home Education Exchange's uh, researcher working group. And um, we are starting this uh, to try to facilitate opportunities for you folks to find support and community um, and um, peers uh, to help us produce quality research. And uh, what the plan is for today is in these uh, first opening minutes, we're going to ask you to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about where you are and uh, the kind of research that um, you are conducting. And also uh, during the second part, uh, Dan Hamlin is going to do a presentation, which you will be able to see. He has capabilities of sharing his screen. Uh, and he is going to um, do a presentation as sort of a model for the kind of presentations that some of you may be familiar with and others of us may not be in, uh, familiar with it that would be typically uh, presented at an academic conference uh, to, to peers and also, oh, there we go, starting to get video capability. Uh, good morning, I'm Deb Bell and I'm the chair of the research committee for uh, Global Home Education Conference uh, or, or Exchange. And uh, with me is Mike Donnelly, uh, who is the um, secretary of the Global Home Education Exchange, sits on the research committee with me. Uh, and joining us is Albert Cheng, who's a, a scholar in residence on the research committee for Global Home Education. Exchange and um, his colleague, Dan Hamlin, uh, and that is Trudy, who's also our admin for the Global Home Education Exchange. So thank you everybody for joining us this morning. I was just kind of summarizing the agenda so you know what to expect. We'll have introductions in just a moment, then Dan's going to do a presentation uh, uh, that um, we will then have the opportunity to respond to and model for us um, what we might do in this group. So it's one of the many things that Albert and I and Mike have talked about as a possible way of serving uh, homeschool research researchers around the world is to model how we might be able to support each other and uh, help one another be accountable for the research that we do produce and also make sure that what we bring to publication is of the highest quality capable. Uh, and then at the conclusion of Dan's presentation, there'll be time for questions and answers. And then um, on the conclusion of this meeting this morning, we'll have a survey to find out uh, from each of you um, what is valuable to you and how we can plan for the future. So this is really um, something of a of brainstorming session so that we are able to have your input into how this uh, committee or how this working group develops. Uh, it's, we're not, we, it's not predetermined at this point. Uh, we want to make sure that we are meeting your needs because our goal is to produce quality homeschool research. Um, so I'm gonna ask Mike Donnelly and then Albert and Dan to introduce themselves and then I'll ask uh, our attendees to also introduce themselves in the chat. So Mike, do you wanna say something to the group? Oh, thank Thanks a lot, Deb. Uh, welcome, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, so glad that you've all joined us from all over the world. In fact, we have a little poll I'd like to push out here. What continent are you from? Um, this is a global research gathering. And uh, we want to, it looks like we have lo lots of North America. That's great. Africa. Wow, look at Africa. That's awesome. Europe, Asia, South America. Welcome from all over the world. We're so glad that you uh, were able to join us this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Um, and uh, very night. excited <laughs> in middle of the night for some really yeah maybe <laughs> w welcome very glad to have you um, Albert you want to introduce yourself then thanks yeah sure hey everybody um, uh, name's Albert um, a uh, good morning from uh, Fayetteville Arkansas um, in the United States I'm a professor at the University of Arkansas um, and uh, I, I guess I'll won't say much more. Um, I know maybe you might have seen um, 
uh, me listed as uh, presenting my research, but um, you know, you have to pardon the bait and switch. You're getting something better in um, Dan Hamlin. Um, and so maybe I'll turn it over to him to introduce himself. I don't know about that, Albert. Um, <laughs> uh, good morning to everyone or uh, good evening, depending on where you may be. Uh, my name is Dan Hamlin. I'm an assistant professor of educational leadership and, and policy studies at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, I have done some homeschool research in the past, uh, but my research primarily looks at school strategies for influencing parental involvement, student safety, school climate, and other life outcomes. And I uh, primarily use a mix of uh, quantitative as well as some qualitative methods in my work. I think uh, this morning when I present, you should feel free to chime in at any, any time with uh, questions. I think we can keep this at least from the standpoint of my presentation, as informal as possible. So I think feel free to, to, to go ahead with your questions and we'll try to do our best to answer them for you. So I went ahead and launched the poll. You can see where all of our participants are from and uh, all over the world. It's very exciting. Uh, good concentration in North America, but uh, Europe, Africa, Asia, South America. And so uh, I'm the director for global outreach and a senior counsel at the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, as well as a secretary for the Global Home Education Exchange Council. And uh, Trudy uh, Miller, who's here also is my assistant. And uh, we want to welcome you. Thanks. Thanks everybody on the panel for your help. So um, now that we know what continent you're on, uh, folks, would you mind just putting up in the chat what you'd like to tell the group about yourself? What country are you in? And uh, what, is your, what is your profession? Perhaps professional identity, whether you're a student, a graduate student, a professor, a practitioner, a policy maker. I know that we have, uh, 50 people signed up to attend this morning and that it's a pretty diverse group. And then would you also, if you are actively engaged in uh, research at the time, just introduce, uh, just mention the research that you are conducting. Thank you and we'll, and uh, for folks, make sure that you click on the chat at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to see where everybody is from. Welcome Maria from Manila. I know we have quite a few people from the Philippines, uh, professor at the University of the Philippines. Godfrey is a, a member of our um, GHEX board and is also, uh, you're, com you're completing a master's, I believe recently Godfrey, and you submitted an excellent piece of research to the GHEX research committee for our currently postponed conference. Looking forward to you being able to um, join us when we reschedule. Brian Ray, who many of you will know Brian Ray as one of the lead researchers of, of home education here in the United States. Glad you were able to make it. It's very, very early <laughs> where Brian is. So anybody else on the West Coast? Thank you. Ah and Dr. Lauren Bales at the University of Delaware, former student of mine, so I always like to claim her. She's an excellent scholar. And Gerald Hubner is with us. He is the chair of um, the Global Home Education Exchange. Thanks, Gerald. I know it's early where you are. Moscow is represented. Dr. Cheryl Field Smith, thank you so much, Dr. Field Smith, for joining us this morning. We're we're very very honored to have you with us. Uh, Cheryl is is really producing some excellent research here in the United States on the black uh, family on black families and the homeschool community there, and their demographics and their motivation for homeschooling, um, and we're. Really pleased to be able to have you participate. We have quite a few from South Africa are joining us uh, and also from, from Israel. Uh, Dr. Guterman has uh, produced, has published research on homeschooling in Israel. Well, thank you, everybody. Continue to introduce yourselves to the group. 
um, as we get started here with our presentation and uh, feel free to uh, pay attention to the, uh, to the uh, presentation as well as continue to uh, interact with one another. We'll have a, uh, in our survey at the end, we'll ask for your permission to uh, put your contact um, information, make contact information available to whatever degree you'd like to other members of this group so that we can begin to um, perhaps help you connect with one another um, outside of our monthly meetings. So I think at this point, um, Albert, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'd, I think it might be wise to just kind of explain uh, to the group what is the purpose of this kind of presentation uh, in the academic uh, community and how it could perhaps serve us in terms of our own research agenda. Yeah, sure, Deborah. Um, so anyway, good morning again, everybody. Um, so I just wanna welcome you myself um, to this uh, forum. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe about a month ago, or it actually feels like a long time ago, um, when uh, COVID-19 started making its way around everywhere, um, I was chatting with Deborah and Mike um, uh, just to brainstorm about what we might do about um, uh, the Global Home Education Conference um, that's been canceled. And um, at, around that time, um, there's another academic conference that I usually attend, and um, they had decided to go. Hey, uh, Albert, I'm going to oh. jump in just for yeah. a second. We have not canceled the conference. It's oh. postponed. Postponed. It's not Sorry. canceled. We're just postponing it, just to clarify. Thank you very much. Keep got it. it. Got delayed, postponed. Yes, it will happen again. <laughs> uh, apologies. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, and and so um, you know, for so there's another academic conference I usually attend, and um, they decided to go fully online, um, which is, which is a new thing. And so um, we thought, well, um, why don't we? follow suit and, and do something similar. Um, after all, um, uh, it's not all the time that we get to meet and certainly given our uh, circumstances um, these days, um, uh, meeting in this kind of forum um, uh, is, is sort of uh, uh, probably standard practice. Um, and so it occurs to us that, um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to, to build something, um, to build, um, uh, a new rhythm, a build, some, build something new, a new forum where um, we might be able to come together somewhat regularly um, to chat about homeschool research. Um, you know, in the moment, I'll, I'll, I'm going to turn over to Dan, but, you know, Dan's going to present um, a paper uh, that he and I, um, uh, we were, you know, we both uh, were at Harvard together, um, sitting in our offices. And um, one afternoon, I just um, proposed to Dan, hey, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to um, look at this topic about homeschooling. Um, I know there's this data set that you can use. And you know, Dan thought about it and, and, and found it interesting. And lo and behold, he took the baton and ran with it. And um, you know, it's now become a, a, a piece published in the uh, recent special issue that we have in the Peabody Journal of Education. Um, and, I, and I bring that story up because um, you know, when, when he and I were both at Harvard, um, having the, you know, the capacity to, to share an office space, um, you know, have somewhat of an intellectual community where we would interact together on a regular basis, um, that, you know, those everyday reactions uh, played a, a key role in, and they continue to play a key role in how we think about research, the topics that we um, decide to tackle, the projects that we decide to take on. Um, you know, Dan and I chat regularly um, over the phone, over email about um, uh, what we're up to, uh, you know, new papers that come out. Um, and so, you know, for our lives, um, you know, we have these regular rhythms that, uh, in, in a sense, um, are, are, are baked into our research life and um, make our research, our scholarly life possible. Um, you know, certainly while we were at Harvard, um, uh, you know, they have all sorts of money there. So um, every department um, has, uh, you know, fancy lunches and they invite guests, guest speakers from all over the country to come and present their research. Um, and, you know, that was certainly a luxury, but it was certainly a formative luxury in developing um, scholars. So, um, and certainly me and Dan as, as in, in our, our own scholarly development. Um, and it occurs to Deborah, Mike, and I during our conversation a few months ago that, you know, this kind of regular forum 
is something that the homeschool research community, many of you all, um, don't get. And so it occurs to us, well, why don't, what, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a, a neat opportunity to try to build something um, here and now, um, given that um, the Global Home Education Conference is postponed? Did I get that right, Mike? <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, Albert. Yes, good job. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, since you since you've mentioned Harvard about I don't know ten times appropriately, a uh, very revered and respected institution, it would be appropriate I think to comment on the situation in Harvard. So maybe you can, as you're introducing Dan, you can if you if you're aware of it. I assume you are. This research flap. Uh, maybe you guys can address oh, that, Dan. That. Maybe you will because I think your research, Dan, is right on point. So I'll just leave uh, that to you guys. All right. Well, we'll see if we want to wait in there. Um, but uh, anyway, so you know, I, I guess my, my broader point is that um, you know we hope that that um, this becomes um, a forum that's useful for you as as folks that participate here. That this might be something that you integrate. Um, uh, into your, again, your, your routine, your rhythm of, of being an academic, being a scholar, being um, anybody um, in the homeschool research community. Um, you know, maybe you, you mostly do advocacy. Um, maybe you do mostly research. Maybe you're a practitioner. Um, that, you know, that this still is a forum for everyone um, simply because, uh, you know, uh, having the opportunity to network, to come together, to hear uh, work that's being done, um, that these are all things that are um, uh, not just useful, for that, but I, I'd even say, you know, necessary to, um, you know, build and coordinate and, um, and seek the good together. Um, so um, anyway, this is, this is what we're envisioning for this. And so, um, you know, I, I don't want to take uh, much more time. I want to turn it over to Dan. Um, to present this work, um, uh, I, I guess I'll, you know, since Mike plugged the Harvard thing, I'll, I'll send uh, a little link to a, a, a chat, um, in chat maybe, of, of what was going on um, there. Um, I fear we may uh, get too distracted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that. let's get to, we want to so, do the presentation um, yeah. and uh, we can have a side conversation. Yeah. So um, j just a couple notes about just presentation, as, as Dan mentioned um, before we get started here, um, uh, that, that you should feel free to um, interrupt with questions. Um, and so by interrupt, um, what I mean is, um, so if you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be a chat box, or, or not a chat, I'm sorry, uh, a Q&A um, box. Um, if you just click that, um, uh, I'm not exactly 100% sure how this works. Are you able to, are, are folks able to? Yep, um, they just click on the Q&A and um, they can, they should be able to chat type in a, a question. question. Okay, yep. all and right. Then, because, and then we'll uh, see that and we'll be able to look at those and answer them either by uh, typing in an answer possibly or Dan can um, respond verbally. Okay, yeah. yeah Albert, so, I'll let you uh, manage the Q&A and, uh, uh, and I'll handle the chat box. All right, excellent, Kathleena. That's a nice test. Thank you, and, and hello. <laughs> um, so this works. Uh, so yeah, I'll I'll, um, I'll I'll be moderating, and, and so Dan, um, uh, you know, if you'll excuse me, I'll I'll be the one that um, interrupts you um, to ask any clarifying questions. And certainly after Dan is finished, um, we'll open it up to um, a broader Q and A. Um, of course, you can uh, chat your question. I, I believe there's also a way to raise your hand in chat, but we'll, um, but for while Dan's speaking, um, go ahead and type in any uh, questions you might have um, in chat and, and I'll uh, moderate that. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dan, um, a dear friend and colleague of mine. Um, you know, we, we spent uh, many of, uh, 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 you know, actually it's just a short year um, together at Harvard, but uh, many a fond memories, um, uh, both scholarly and, and also, um, as as uh, as friends as well. So, um, Dan, I'll turn it over to you to uh, present present your work. Well, thank you. And and Mike, I I don't think I'm going to touch the professor um, comment. Um, I'll I'll leave that to you. I don't know that she was drawing on research of any kind in her comments. Um, I'll just tell you from my standpoint and from my perspective as a as a researcher and my approach. I usually do. I usually try not to um, weigh in too much with an opinion or to advocate for anything, particularly when I'm on, on a topic that that I'm researching. So 
I will, I will, I will leave those comments to you because I don't think she was um, presenting any kind of research. She was just kind of laying out an opinion that wasn't, uh, didn't appear to be informed by any empirical data whatsoever. So. Well, and in so commenting, you've made all the comment I would ask <laughs> anyone to make. So thank you, Dan. Well done. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, let me see. Okay. And let me, okay, are you able to see my presentation now on the yeah. screen? Looks great. Okay. And I'm just gonna turn that into slideshow. Slide this over, okay. Sorry, I'm just minimizing a few things. Okay, so uh, the study that I'm presenting is do homeschooled students lack opportunities to acquire cultural capital? And I'll be uh, dis discuss discussing evidence from a nationally representative survey. Uh, when I say nationally representative, I'm talking about nationally representative here in the United States. Um, and, and that data comes from the uh, National Household Education Study. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit uh, further down in some of the slides here. Uh, so just to give you, I, I wanna give you kind of just a brief overview of the whole study. So essentially this term cultural capital, it broadly refers to upper class traits, dispositions, values um, that, that, are, that help to confer or societal rewards to individuals or groups. And one concern that exists out there in debates about homeschooling is that, well, uh, because homeschoolers don't attend a traditional brick and mortar school, that they're missing on a, out on opportunities to develop cultural capital in arts, music, literature, and foreign language classes. And so in this, in this study, I try to understand opportunities for homeschoolers to develop cultural capital by looking at uh, this nationally representative uh, data and really doing a comparison of public, private, and, and homeschooled students. And so the, here's, here's basically what the main results show. So uh, the descriptive results show that uh, for formal instruction in music, arts, uh, language, and literature, so those humanities subjects that are closely linked to this notion of cultural capital, that uh, instruction in those subjects is lacking in about 40% of homeschool households. Um, however, when you compare homeschoolers to uh, public school households, you'll see that uh, homeschoolers report much statistically much higher uh, rates of participation in a, in a whole range of cultural and family activities, and particularly so for uh, cultural activities that have been directly linked to cultural capital development. So that's an overview of the study. Now I'll, I'll get into it. Oh, let me see here. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so as I mentioned, this concept of, of culture capital was a French sociologist, Pierre Bourdieu's uh, signature concept. And again, it broadly refers to this, this idea um, that uh, high status cultural attributes or knowledge can confer sort of societal re rewards to individuals or groups. And this concept has been used quite a bit in, uh, in sociology. So, if, so I think thousands of studies really have been done, in, particularly in sociology, and, and in using this idea of cultural capital to understand variation, social class variation, educational and life outcomes. So why is it essentially, so, so cultural capital is used essentially to try to explain why the affluent have sort of a class advantage out in society. In the educational arena, it's thought that um, cultural capital can kind of offer an advantage to the affluent by allowing them to kind of convert their cultural capital into higher, higher achievement, higher educational attainment, uh, more prestigious credentials at more prestigious institutions, for example. And so it's, it's this idea that institutions will value and recognize uh, the cultural capital that's held by the affluent and then possibly conflate that with individual competence or ability and that the elites are able then to take advantage of that um, in these in these more formal arenas and so when when Bourdieu initially posited this this concept of, of cultural capital he primarily saw cultural capital as a way of 
for the rich to essentially reproduce themselves. So this, this was a mechanism for, for reproducing uh, social inequality. But uh, over the years, uh, there have been a number of empirical studies that have actually put Pierre, Pierre Bajou's uh, theory to the test and have used data to try to understand, well, is this theoretical idea, um, does, it, does it really bear out in the data? And what's, what's really been kind of an interesting finding in these empirical studies is that really it, it doesn't seem to, to matter whether you're affluent or not, that anyone can develop and use cultural capital. And so um, it really doesn't matter your, your socioeconomic background that, you, that uh, a student or a person can actually leverage cultural capital for their educational or, or professional careers. And so why this is significant is that th this prospect, uh, particularly for low income or maybe students from non-affluent classes, um, this prospect may make schools a really important setting for youth to, to acquire cultural capital, valuable cultural capital that they can use to advance themselves. And so uh, this kind of raises the concern for home students uh, who, who may lose out on these opportunities to develop cultural capital at school. And so th this is, you might look at this as being particularly significant because homeschooling is growing phenomenon in the United States. And as I understand it, it, it it's growing in many places around the world. Um, I've written here, we, uh, with this citation in 2016, we have about uh, nearly 2 million students, but I believe we're, um, some estimates now suggest that we're well over 2 million students now. Um, and so one of the, of course, one of the concerns here is that replicating school experiences that, that could possibly um, transmit cultural capital to students may be difficult for homeschool fa families. So if you think about uh, the instruments in a music class, or if you think about the supplies in an art class, if you think about the books in a library, or participation in student clubs, if you think about possibly professional guidance from uh, a teacher that's been well trained in, in foreign language or literature, these, these experiences may be difficult to replicate. And, and so in the literature, there's a little bit on this in, in the homeschool literature that's sought to understand how, how difficult is it for homeschool uh, teachers, homeschool parents to replicate these, experience, these experiences. And so, or how do they in their own way possibly replicate some of these experiences? And so some descriptive evidence out there in the literature suggests that homeschool families actually will dedicate much more time and resources to exposing their children to cultural activities or community and cultural organizations um, and, and thereby possibly creating opportunities for their children to develop and form and acquire cultural capital outside of uh, what might happen in, during formal instruction, instructional time. But uh, this, this scholarship is largely anecdotal um, and there's been very little research um, that's actually looked at actually put this to the test to see you know, whether whether homeschool students actually have opportunities to acquire cultural capital. Okay, so my research question, as you may have inferred by the title, is do homeschool students lack opportunities to acquire cultural capital, right, which is sort of that, that concern uh, that's been advanced out there uh, in debates on homeschooling. And so my main data source comes from the National Household Education Study 2016. And as I mentioned, it's a nationally representative study here in the U.S., and it has over 14,000 families or 14,000 households, uh, 14,075 to be exact. So it's a, it's, a, it's a large sample that contains uh, private school families, public school families, and uh, at least in the context of homeschooling research, a very large number of homeschool students at uh, 552 homeschool households. So that's offers some nice opportunities for some statistic to do some statistical analysis. Okay, so my dependent variables. Now, uh, this, for this idea of cultural capital, scholars have used uh, really a whole different, uh, really a wide array of different proxy measures to kind of understand this broader notion of cultural capital. So some of the more common ones have been looking at visits to art galleries or museums. Uh, there was actually an experimental study done uh, by Albert's, Albert's colleagues at the University of Arkansas that actually looked at cultural development um, 
uh, cultural capital development uh, through visits to art galleries and museums and found that low-income students actually were able to acquire uh, cultural capital uh, by attending uh, art galleries and museums and to really become uh, cultural consumers, which is quite interesting. And it was in a, an experimental study, which was great. Uh, but scholars have also looked at uh, live artistic performances, attendance uh, at a zoo or an aquarium or an athletic event, uh, going to an historical site or attending a lecture. Uh, some of these have been some of the uh, more commonly used measures of uh, proxy measures for cultural capital in the literature. So in my study, I'm going to look so at- Dan, my, let me um, yeah, interrupt sure. you for a little bit. I mean, you, you made Please a, do. yeah, you, you made a neat distinction here. So I, I heard you at the beginning of your presentation, refer to your results as descriptive. Um, and then now you've um, cited this um, art museum study as experimental. So can you um, tell folks, so what's the difference between the two? So, um, you know, what's the difference between a descriptive study and an experimental study? And um, what advantages does, um, I'm assuming the experimental study have that the, a descriptive study does not? Sure. So uh, to be precise, I would, the study that I'm presenting is, I, I think it's really a mix of descript, presenting descriptive data as well as correlational data. And, and maybe we can uh, allow these methodological differences uh, to be kind of a, a, a thread throughout this presentation. So why don't you chime in at any time to kind of point out the differences. But essentially, uh, descriptive data, that's just going to be average um, average comparison. So mean, standard deviations, min and max, uh, minimum and maximum values. So that, that's essentially what you're getting with descriptive data. Now with correlational data, um, essentially what you're doing is you're, you're looking at relationships and, and in many cases what you'll be doing is looking at a relationship while taking into account or holding constant other facts. So um, for example, if you're um, if you're comparing academic achievement uh, between, uh, say, let's say you're comparing the test scores of uh, uh, public school students and private school students. Well, in order to do that comparison, there are a number of factors that you might want to hold constant to, to derive a more valid comparison of public and private school students. So um, one thing you might do is you might want to take into account the prior achievement of the students. You might want to take into account the class size. You might want to take into account the socioeconomic background of the students. And so you might want to take into account the age of the students uh, because what you don't want to do is compare the achievement of public and private school students and say, well, look, the public school students are achieving higher, the private school students are achieving higher, but really what you're seeing in that difference is a difference in age between the students in the private schools or a difference in socioeconomic background for the students in the private schools. And so correlational research will try to control for that. Now, here's where the experimental study is really valuable. With the correlational studies, the, 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 the challenge here is that, I mean, you can control for many different things, but you can never really be sure that you've controlled for everything that matters. Let's take this, that example of the private and public school students again, that you can never be 100% sure that you've fully controlled for everything that matters in the sort of underlying differences between the public and private school students. And so the utility and, and um, really the, the usefulness of the experimental study is if students are randomly assigned in an experimental study, you can, you can net out all of those other underlying factors. And so you can, you can derive a sort of causal, at least within the, co within the context of your study sample, you can, derive, you, you can derive a causal estimate of a particular relationship. Albert, you wanna chime back in and add anything to that? Uh, no, this is, that, that was a, a, a great explanation. Um, I don't have to put my teaching hat on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. So, um, and, and please do continue to interrupt and um, add anything that you'd like to add as I move through this. And I'm going to, I promise to those yeah. listening, well, we're, well, getting, actually, we're getting into, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And since you, since you mentioned this, um, so, so Brian Ray, um, you know, just a follow-up question to that. Um, uh, actually, it's not actually a question. He's pointing out that there's a, uh, a nice study um, looks like it's an educational researcher, one of the um, kind of flagship AERA, American Education 
Edu Educational Research Association journals, um, uh, giving some kind of taxonomy of study design. Um, uh, oh, actually, he does have a question on this. I'm kind of reading his comment. I, I don't know. If you, are you familiar with that article, Dan? I, I guess he. Who is the yeah, author? Um, John uh, Burke Johnson, 2001 piece. So. Um, I'm not familiar with it. No. Yeah. Um, well, you know, certainly we can we can follow up on that. Um, I, 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 if if I'm imagining what's in there, um, uh, it, it seems like yeah. He, uh, as you say, Brian, he, he's trying to classify. Um, different types of non-experimental research, and I'm assuming, um, you know, what you can or cannot say or conclude or infer from these studies. Um, anyway, take a look in, in, in the Q&A box, um, everyone. I, I believe, uh, uh, well, Brian, Brian is uh, saying it was hel it's helpful. So um, I'll, I, I guess I'll, I'll commend that article to, uh, to everyone. All right, go ahead, Dan. I just put it oh. in the chat box, Albert, so everyone can see it for future reference. Got it. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, so uh, the, 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 um, the, the, just to get back into the study here, and I'm, I'm gonna move to the results here as quickly as possible, because I'm sure that's what many of you are interested in. So the dependent variables that I'll be looking at are uh, seven different cultural activities, seven family activities, and four humanities subjects. So specifically music, arts, um, literature and uh, foreign language. And for my da uh, data analysis, so I'll, I'll be doing a descriptive analysis of formal instruction in those four humanities subjects for homeschooled families. So on the survey, only homeschooled families were asked what subjects they teach at home. So that's just going to be a descriptive breakdown. Then I'm going to perform a logistic regression where I'm comparing uh, those cultural and family activities that I mentioned, comparing um, participation in those activities between homeschooled students and their public and private school peers. And for that analysis, I mentioned uh, the use of control variables. I'll be using a, a standard list of, of controls for child age, sex, race, special education status, household income, parental education, household size, family structure, and also geographic locale. So whether they're in an urban, suburban, or rural area. So a pretty standard list of controls, I would say there. Um, although you might imagine there might be some controls that, that um, are, are left out that may be important for, um, for, for looking at some of these relationships that I, that I will present in just a moment. So Dan, before you jump to your results, there's uh, I guess a couple of related questions um, that have come up um, uh, just you know, based on your past slide. Um, so notice in your second bullet point on, in the previous slide, um, uh, you mentioned waiting, um, and uh, so so Don McCullough has a, a question here related to this. Um, so I noticed that in the national sample, the number of homeschoolers was 3.9 percent of the sample. Uh, would this percent reflect the total population? Um, would that number be uh, would that number uh, then be much higher than the two million homeschoolers stating at the beginning? So um, yeah, if you could kind of get into it, so what's the you know, reason you wait and kind of talk about the sample and, and you know, how, how is that national representativeness constructed and um, what do these kind of percentage breakdowns in the sample have to do with that? Well, I could probably turn that one back over to you. You've done a lot of work. <laughs> uh, Go ahead yeah. and answer your own question. You're an expert on this. Touche, touche. Um, all right. So I'll, I'll earn my keep. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Don, um, uh, so, so again, it's um, in these national samples, um, the, the percentages might actually not reflect the actual percentages in the population. Um, the reason for that is that is in, in any random sampling, um, folks might try to oversample particular groups in order to boost the uh, number of observations, um, the sample size um, in those groups so you can do statistical analysis. So. Um, that 3.9% in the, uh, the, the, the data set that Dan's using, um, th that uh, likely does not reflect the percentage that's actually in the population. Um, so it could be higher, it could be lower, right? There's, there's lots of reasons for why. And can um, I, can I, can I jump, or not. Yeah, can I jump in there? So, and it's also likely, what, what they'll often do is they'll oversample particular groups 
So if the, if the group is a smaller subgroup, then they'll, they'll oversample that smaller subgroup to make sure they've, they've uh, captured it on the survey. Is that correct, Albert? Yes, yes, that, uh, that's, that, and that's exactly right. Um, also, uh, the, the other question here is, um, so what's a logistic regression for the folks who um, have not taken econometrics? Oh, you're going to have to take my statistics course for that one. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You offer it online? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, uh, essentially, um, it's not too different from a, a standard regression analysis, but the, the logistic regression allows you to look at a binary variable. So, um, you know, so, so for example, if you want to predict whether a student graduates on time or not. So that's either they do or they don't. And so you could use a set of predictor variables to predict whether a student graduates on time or not. So that's what a, a logistic regression will essentially allow you to do. Do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, but there's a, a nice follow-up question related to that. Um, uh, speaking about your dependent variables in your analysis. So, so PJO is, is um, asking, uh, do, do you think the proxies we often use to represent cultural capital disadvantages certain demographics? Could they be too elitist, in other words? Um, in many urban centers, often middle and high school students are working jobs to support the family. So it seems they're disadvantaged in ways related to the amount of free time available to acquire cultural capital as measured by some proxies. So um, yeah, again, it, are, are these proxies too elitist? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's a really good, I mean, you raise a, a really interesting question. I mean, and that question, I think, is really at the heart of the debate over, uh, over cultural capital, what it is, and who has access to it. So per, Pierre Bourdieu kind of argued that um, only, that, that really cultural capital is, is the sole possession of the affluent. And, and maybe one of the rationales that he would give is that, yeah, um, low-income folks are maybe working two or three jobs and, and, and uh, can't access these, these opportunities to develop cultural capital like the affluent can. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, some of the empirical studies have found that when given the opportunity, um, uh, students and, and people from non-affluent classes can develop uh, cultural capital just as easily as anyone else. Uh, but I think uh, the the question there um, remains that you know what are the what are the opportunities like and so and so again this gets back to the to the homeschool debate um, perhaps for for students who are not affluent being able to attend school is is where they're able to get these these opportunities to be exposed to cultural capital through arts and music and language classes, through field trips, through enrichment activities. And so that's one of the, the debates that's out there on this uh, idea of cultural capital. All right, so I'll, I'll let you continue. We wanna see the results. Okay. <laughs> and, and as a very, very quick side note, so I usually, uh, when I'm presenting a scholarly presentation, I'll try to move through, so I'm going to, I'm, the next slide uh, will, will, the results will begin on the next slide. One of the things I, I normally try to do is, is get to the results as quickly as possible. So I usually the front end is about five minutes and I'll usually spend about 10 minutes on the results and then discussing the results. Okay, so here's uh, just a breakdown of the sample here. And um, there are a couple interesting things to note. So if you look at that red box um, where I'm, I'm looking at parental education level, and you can see for the homeschoolers, um, so for homeschoolers with a high school education or less, about four of them in the homeschool sample have a high school education or less. And you can compare that with the private school households where it's about um, that same number, that, for that same category, it's about 14%. So only 14% of private school households have a high school education or less. And then for public schoolers, uh, it's about 36%. Uh, then if you look at university degree holders or higher, it's about 32% for homeschoolers, 64% for private school, and 30, 36% for public school. So it's, it's possible that um, for example, when you have nearly 40% of the sample with a high school education or less in the, in the, among homeschool families, um, you might argue that, that it it's, could be difficult for a homeschool uh, parent-teacher to be 
uh, a multi-content expert in a, in a lot of different areas if they maybe lack um, a, f uh, a formal university education. That might be a debate. I'm not saying that that's true, I'm saying that could be part of the debate. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, homeschoolers were asked subjects they teach, and I have here these humanities subjects that are linked to culture capital, music, arts, literature, and foreign language. And if you look at the x-axis here, so this is a very sort of simple breakdown, I have uh, the percentage of homeschool households that report teaching sort of the number of the, uh, the number of these subjects. So zero, they don't teach music, arts, literature, or foreign language, they don't teach any of them. Um, and then one, meaning they teach one of these subjects, two, they teach two, and all the way up to four. So they teach all four, music, arts, literature, and foreign language. And now I've, I've broken this down by whether they uh, participate in a uh, homeschool cooperative or not. And so what you'll notice there, if you look at uh, house, uh, homeschool households that report teaching all four subjects, you'll see that 46% of uh, homeschool households that participate in co-ops actually are able to deliver instruction in all four of these subjects, which I, I think is interesting, kind of raises some questions about co-ops and, and they may or may not enable uh, for delivering instruction in these areas. And then if you compare homeschoolers who don't participate in a co-op, in a co uh, it's about 20%, uh, 22% uh, are reporting instruction in all four uh, of these subjects. And then um, you have a very small number um, that report not teaching any of these subjects. So about 2% for the co-op participants and about 6% um, of the non-co-op participants uh, report not teaching any of these subjects. Okay, now here are the results of the logistic regression that I mentioned. And the results are homeschoolers relative relative to uh, public school households. And these results include the standard controls that I mentioned earlier. So those controls for parental education, socioeconomic status, um, race, um, um, child age, sex, and so on. So all those controls that I mentioned earlier. And what you can see here for these, uh, for, for these seven cultural activities is that Homeschoolers in general report uh, much, much higher rates of participation relative to public schoolers uh, on these activities after you, you control for these different factors. So if you look at, uh, we'll start with the first one. So going to a bookstore, they're 1.5 times more likely to do that. Sporting event is really the only one where they're the same. So they're, they're, uh, the homeschool and public school families are equally likely to do that. So that's why it's a one there. Uh, to go to a community event, they're uh, more than two times likely. Homeschoolers are 2.2 times more likely to attend a community event, one and a half times more likely to go to a zoo or an aquarium with their kids. Uh, they're nearly three times more likely uh, to go to a about equally as likely to attend a live performance. And then they're about two and a half times more likely to visit an art gallery or a museum with their kids. And so I, I think what's interesting here, if you look at attending a library or visiting an art gallery or museum, these tend to be uh, uh, measures that are proxy measures that are frequently used to assess or get at this idea of culture capital. And those happen to be the activities that homeschoolers really report doing much more of. So that is interesting from a cultural capital acquisition standpoint. Okay, and um, then, I'm, then in this, on this next slide, I'm reporting results for seven family activities. And some of these are a little bit more loosely tied to ideas of cultural capital. Um, but you'll notice that the one that I think is, is most closely tied to cultural capital acquisition, arts and crafts, homeschoolers are reporting more than two and a half times. They're, they're 2.6 times more likely than public schoolers to on a week to week basis, um, uh, engage in arts and crafts and do arts and crafts with their kids. Okay, so then on this, on this slide here, what I've done is I've broken out the sample uh, based on parental education. Okay, so if you look there at the top, I have high school education or less in the first three columns. And then in the uh, last three columns, I have university degree or higher. And then, so if you look, if we start with high school education or less, 
And we can break that down by homeschool, private school, public school. And then on the, on the far left, uh, on the far left hand slide or side, I have uh, cultural activities. So participation in cultural activities, zero to one, two to four, five to seven. And then I also have family activities, zero to one, two to four, five to seven. Uh, now, if you look at that red box there, because that red box is, is really what I think is kind of interesting to look at here. So if you look at the column with home, high school educated us, homeschool families, and go down to participation in five to seven activities. Interestingly, homeschool families with a high school education or less, 21% report participation in five to seven um, uh, cultural activities, which is interesting. It gets back to that question about uh, cultural and education and, and socioeconomic disadvantage and having opportunities to engage in cultural capital acquisition. And, and here, um, at least descriptively, what's interesting here is that homeschoolers with a high school education or less, 21% are reporting participation in five to seven of these activities, which, which is quite remarkable, and much higher than uh, the private and public school parents with a high school education or less. So the private schools report uh, about 5% are reporting uh, five to seven cultural activities. And the public school parents, 8% uh, of those are reporting five participation in five to seven cultural activities. And, and maybe what's even more interesting, if you, if you look at the same row, so the cultural activities, participation in five to seven, uh, so let's compare the high, homeschool with high school education or less, which is 21%, with parents who have a university degree or higher in a private and a public school. And what I find to be pretty interesting here, maybe I should have put the red box uh, there instead, is that if you look at uh, private school parents with a university degree or higher, only 19% are reporting five to seven cultural activities. And public school parents uh, with a university degree or higher, only 17% are reporting five to seven cultural activities. And so the homeschool parent with a high school education or less is reporting more participation in these activities than private and public school parents with a university degree or higher. So that's pretty interesting. Okay, so um, it's thought that cultural capital can, can advance positive educational and life outcomes for students. And you might even argue that the acquisition of cultural capital is an important developmental outcome in its own right. And so one concern with homeschool families is it could be difficult to be a, a multi-subject content expert in humanities subjects like art, music, foreign language. It could be cost prohibitive to uh, deliver uh, subjects like music and art, right? So if you think about the cost of musical instruments or art supplies. And so this could present certain challenges for homeschool families. And, and so it's possible, at least if you look at the results of this study, that uh, one of the ways that they can kind of expose their children to these opportunities is through greater participation in cultural and family activities that can allow their children to acquire cultural capital uh, outside of just formal instructional opportunities. And if you look at the results in this study for um, activities that are really close proxies for cultural capital, like visits to art galleries and museums, homeschoolers reported much greater participation in those types of activities. Okay, so now there are some important limitations and I'm getting to the end of the study so we can dive, take a deep dive into these limitations. So first off, these, uh, um, this is a non-causal study design, right? It's correlational and descriptive. So I cannot tell you that homeschooling causes greater participation in these types of activities. We, we just don't know. Um, it may be the case that families who decide to homeschool are more committed, dedicated, more motivated, more active, and uh, do these activities no matter what. So if they had their children in private or public schools, they may just do these activities at, at the same rates. And so maybe it has, has nothing to do with homeschooling and it just has to do with the attributes of the parents themselves. And so that, that's one possible limitation. Another consideration, I think this has kind of been alluded to in one of the other questions, was that um, these proxies for cultural capital, uh, it's possible that they wouldn't cover the diverse ways that homeschool and really families in, in other school settings may seek to provide opportunities to develop cultural capital for their kids. And, and so we're kind of limited with the proxy measures that we have. And I, I think it's also worth noting is that cultural capital can, can possibly mean very different things depending on the, the context. So cultural capital may have very different meaning for a family located in a rural area 
versus say one uh, that lives in a very large city. And so cultural capital also can take on different meaning depending on where you're at and where you live. So this study, I, I think it does chart new territory in the literature. There hasn't been a lot of statistical work done in homeschooling period, but there also hasn't been a, a very, there's really been very little that's looked at homeschooling and uh, this idea of cultural capital acquisition. Um, and, and so it does have some limitations and uh, underscores some, some questions for future research. So one of them I think is school parents actually seek to impart some of these cultural capital associated subjects uh, in the humanities like art, music, and foreign language. What's their strategy, if at all, when they, when they seek to, um, to deliver content in these areas? And then, uh, do homeschool uh, parents, teachers, do they seek out supplementary experiences to kind of compensate in a given area? So is it the case that they, that they do report visiting an art gallery or museum much more frequently um, to be, because maybe they're not teaching that formally at home? Um, and then finally, given the results that we saw for homeschool cooperatives and organizations where they're reporting much more uh, activity in arts, music, uh, literature, and foreign language, is there something about participation in these cooperatives that enables more instruction in these areas? Okay, well, thank you very much. And that's all I have. Hey, I'm thanks, gonna stop Dan. my share now, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um... So anyway, we have uh, plenty of time for, for some more questions and comments and, and broader discussion. Um, and so there's a couple um, uh, questions here, um, all kind of related to social capital asked by several of the, the participants here. So, um, and maybe I'll ask, um, uh, so two by uh, Christopher Cordero um, here. Uh, so, so he's asking, Chris, Christopher's asking, is, is church, synagogue, mosque attendance considered a means of acquiring cultural capital? Um, you know, so could we consider cultural capital in terms of like architecture, music, um, uh, literature and Latin, so or language, so like Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Arabic, um, I mean, those are things associated with, with attending um, religious institutions. Um, and, and I guess maybe related to that is, is um, a follow-up question. You know, is, is there, um, uh, are you aware of any research on cultural capital that um, is outside the Western context? Um, you know, again, trying to get at uh, referencing Islam and, and some other uh, cultures here. Such great questions. Uh, yeah, I, I am not aware of any research that's looked at cultural capital outside of the Western context. So. Um, I think it'd be uh, fascinating to, to read a study that looked into some of these contextual differences across cultures. And so you might imagine that cultural capital would take on a very different meaning depending on the, the national culture con context. Now, just because I'm not aware of any research doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist. So there may be something out there. I, I just personally haven't come across it. Um, as far as cultural capital, so, so the way cultural capital was conceptualized by uh, this French academic Berju was that these were kind of high status, that cultural capital was kind of highbrow knowledge and, and values related to arts and music and, and highbrow culture. And so I don't know, I don't think, at least if you, if you read his writings, that he would have con considered um, attendance at a church, synagogue, or mosque as a way of, of, of developing cultural capital. But I think uh, you raise a good point that you do, uh, through attendance, um, say, a church or um, synagogue, you, you do get access to foreign language and, and um, certainly um, uh, literature in, in some ways through, through attendance at a church, mosque, or synagogue. So um, that's something to think about. And um, but I don't know that that's the way that Bourdieu himself conceptualized it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, ju and just a, a, a follow-up to that. Um, you know, PJO is, is uh, so, you know, he's wondering, do you, do you think that the societal value of cultural capital might be based on a dubious assumption that the uh, quote-unquote English gentleman ideal um, is the uh, rest of what society uh, needs to strive for? Um, and so, then he, so he's referencing certainly how we, at least here in the States, um, and I think it's probably true in many places in Europe, how we 
um, uh, certainly have a, a you know, we, we look at the vocational and career technical education um, a bit differently. Um, uh, I mean, any comments on that? Is it, and, and also, I guess a broader question related to that is, so is, is this good? Um, uh, should we celebrate, um, in, in some sense, this, uh, what could be characterized as, as an imposition of uh, particular values and conceptions of the good? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, I think, again, as I mentioned, I think that's a limitation. I mean, so uh, of this particular study and looking at cultural capital is that you, um, it, it's quite possible you could imagine that homeschool households may place value on uh, very different activities that have nothing to do uh, with this, this sort of idea of cultural capital. And you could also imagine that they do quite well without focusing on these more sort of, sort of traditional ideas about what cultural capital is. Um, so for example, you might, you might imagine that remote or rural areas, maybe understanding of, of nature and how to interact with nature and, and how to, how to maybe work with your hands. If you live on a farm, maybe there's, certain capital that that you develop that makes you very successful in those areas and and so maybe maybe that's prioritized over uh say visits to a museum or knowledge of highbrow uh, art and and music uh -huh. um at the same time um i don't know i i mean i i think there's also something to be said for um having a knowledge of these things and, and being sort of culturally culturally literate in some of these areas without maybe um, giving sort of, uh, uh, prioritizing one thing over another, let's say. I think having knowledge, having knowledge is one thing and prioritizing one thing over another is, is another thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, related to that is, I mean, there's a couple questions on, I, I think it's about the, the nature of the survey, the data itself. Um, uh, it seems like, uh, I mean, is this your understanding of the data set? Um, that, that the, the kinds of questions they were asking, um, I mean, you know, going to a library, visiting museums, these seem to be very school specific. Um, so, so, I mean, is, is it possible that, that um, you're, you're in a sense constrained by, um, you know, a, a data set that surveyed on um, mostly school specific type activities or, or were these cultural activities being, you know, or, I, I guess the, the questions, I'm trying to mix them together. Um, yeah. Are these also outside of school culture activities or was it, was there more content on that? Or do you think this is a school specific thing? I mean, I think, I think this is, is, it's a limitation of analyzing this data set. I mean, there's no question about it. And I think if, well, how many home, we have about 46 participants here who are very familiar with homeschooling. And I bet all of them were looking at, or may, maybe a large number of them were looking at those activities and saying, this doesn't cover all the things that homeschoolers do. <laughs> and so I, I'm certain that that's a limitation of this study. Um, with that said, I, I do think though, if you, if you look at the activities and that homeschoolers are reporting much higher participation in these activities, that, that itself is interesting. But again, we have to kind of acknowledge that being constrained to those activities is, is just a limitation of the study. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, uh, Lauren Bales, um, from, uh, University of Delaware, I, I think if you're still there, Lauren, Hey, <laughs> um, uh, so this question, um, about, um, uh, so instead of just simply asking about activities, um, uh, is there data out there, um, uh, that, that might ask, um, about how they actually value these things. So, um, maybe I'll just read her. Um, question for you. Are there available data that may allow you to access both individuals' activities and a social assessment of those activities and personalities? Um, and also, how that how might that affect how you interpret your your results? Well, I think anything that kind of moderates counts of participation in certain activities with an assessment of the value of those activities or, or perhaps the intensity of those activities or the quality of engagement in those activities would certainly um, have potential to, to bolster or um, enhance the results that I presented here. So again, we're looking at counts of participation in these activities. And so let's, let's try to imagine some limitations to that. So if you say, okay, I, 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 um, 
I attended a, a museum or art, art gallery with my child. Um, and then other parents says, yeah, it's, I also attended an art gallery or museum with, uh, with my child. But let's say you go to that art gallery and museum. Uh, so sometimes what I do with my four-year-old, we have a local, um, get, uh, a local museum that's free on Saturdays. So we'll go there and they do a, a two-hour class with kids, which is great. So is that two-hour class different than, say, just going and walking around for 30 minutes? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but I think anything you can kind of add to understand what is the sort of nature of, of that participation would certainly enhance the results. And again, th that's also a limitation. So I think, you know, we, we kind of have sort of enveloped this presentation with a broader discussion about methods. And so here's certainly a methodological limitation that I hope everyone will pay attention to that basically I'm counting up stuff and, 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 and controlling for a range of different factors. But, but the limitation here is that we're counting participation and activity and we're not looking at the nature or the quality of those, of engagement in those activities. And so that remains the limitation. And you know, it's a great question. And, and to get back to the first part of the question there, which was, well, are you aware of any data out there that gets into that? And I, I'm not personally. Um, I almost, uh, maybe Mike or Albert, or I know Brian Ray's listening in, he might have some idea. Uh, but I, I'm not personally aware of anything. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, a couple, I'm going to combine a couple of related questions. I guess we have about, you know, f uh, four minutes left here. Um, uh, so several folks are, are asking, um, uh, so, I mean, you've said that, uh, you know, this, the study isn't causal, um, uh, you know, namely can't really say that homeschooling leads to more cultural capital. Um, what do you think creates um, this appetite in, in parents to pursue this? Um, and, and I guess related to this is um, that, that there's this, um, you alluded to this in your presentation, that there's, um, uh, you know, I guess conventional wisdom out there that, that suggests that, um, uh, you know, low SES parents aren't able to um, pass this on. But, but I mean, their last slide um, was fascinating about, you know, homeschoolers with, uh, homeschool parents with less than a high school education actually having, you know, comparable levels of participation in these activities with college educated private school parents. Um, uh, yeah, what do you, what do you think is driving this and, 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 um, you know, why don't you weigh in on the, this interplay between SES? I mean, it seems like, uh, yeah, what's driving parents both, you know, uh, from all socioeconomic backgrounds, you think to, um, really try to acquire this and, and, um, you know, if, if it's not homeschooling per se, is, is there something else um, unique to homeschoolers that you think are, um, are, are driving some of these results? Yeah, well, so I'll just kind of re reiterate that finding there for homeschoolers with a high, high school education or less. Um, that is an interesting finding. You don't see that often in uh, social science research where uh, parents, in this case, with, with a high school education or less, are... are reporting much higher participation in these cultural activities or higher participation in cultural activities than uh, uh, public school or private school parents with a university degree or higher. So usually that SES gap kind of remains. And in this case, it, it goes away in the homeschool context, which I think is pretty, pretty interesting. Now, um, it sounds like the question kind of wanted me to speculate a little bit about what's behind it. And um, you know, I'm kind of hesitant and, and also very, well, I'll say I'm very reluctant to try, to try to speculate what is sort of the mechanism here. Um, and so I'll, maybe what I'll do is kind of present some, some different possibilities. So one possibility is that um, maybe the opportunity to homeschool, right, the freedom to do that, maybe it, uh, it, it activates something that allows for higher participation whether you're in a higher or lower income background or whether you have a, a, a very high level of education or not. And so maybe, maybe what happens at home is that because you're doing one-on-one -on -one instruction, maybe, maybe instruction is more efficient. Maybe it progresses at a faster pace and enables uh, these opportunities for, for greater opportunities for homeschool families to go out and do these things. That's possible. Another possibility is that just those folks who decide to homeschool are just different in difficult to observe ways and that they're, they're more committed and they're more driven. And, and so you might imagine 
as I mentioned earlier, that maybe they would just do these things irrespective of where their kids attended school, whether they did homeschool or, or private school or public school, that these kinds of parents that homeschool are just very dedicated and motivated. And so that's why we can't say with these correlational data that homeschool is, is causing this participation because we just, we, we don't know if we've observed all of the relevant factors. Yeah, so, um, uh... I guess we have time for maybe one more, and I want you to chime in on, on this one too. This is half my question, but I'll bake in some other questions that are being asked here. Um, you know, so there's a lot of questions on about homes uh, and about cultural capital, and we've raised this issue um, uh, of whether you know cultural capital takes into account different contexts, right? So, um, you know, we mentioned PJ's question about is this just this vision of the English gentleman? We talked about SES, right? That it seems like there's a very um, it, it's certainly a non-neutral conception. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, you know, the, it's just one qu broad question about cultural capital is that does, does the research you're aware of on cultural capital take into consideration, um, I guess, very, you know, different contexts and interests that, that vary, um, you know, across different segments of the population? Um, uh, and, and I guess the this is where I'm going to insert my question. I'd like you to answer or, or chime in on this for, for the viewers here. Um, it, it does seem to me that um, to dig uh, further into the data, um, this, this seems like a topic ripe for qualitative research um, to a set, you know, sit down with homeschool families and just um, observe them, participate with them, interview them. Um, certainly you, um, you know, despite all your econometric uh, prowess, uh, do a lot of qualitative work yourself. Um, so, you know, is, uh, share your thoughts on, on what um, kinds of projects, perhaps qualitative projects, you think might enhance what you're finding here, uh, particularly in relation to unpacking, you know, this, this, uh, the, the idea of social cap or cultural capital and what that entails. Um, and how might you go about pulling off, um, you know, a, a study like that? Yeah, so um, I, I think sort of a, a, an ongoing thread here is what is cultural capital for, for homeschoolers? And I, I think so there's, a, there's kind of a good question emerging here. And there is evidence. So if you look at the sociological literature, there are a lot of scholars that, that argue that cultural capital is, is context dependent. So if you look at, you can look at the work of Randall Collins, for example, who really gets into this can the contextual moderation of, of cultural capital and so that might be a good starting point for someone who's kind of interesting interested in understanding how cultural capital may vary not just for homeschoolers but also the context that homeschoolers operate within now if you were going to perform a qualitative study i mean sure you could you could do some some very rich ethnographic work um, you could certainly um, uh, uh, supplement that ethnographic work with um, possibly interviews, but it would be interesting to see how uh, cultural capital kind of kind of varies depending not just on homeschoolers, but but also the homeschooling context. So um, uh, I've met homeschoolers that um, live in large cities, uh, and and how they understand and view cultural capital is very different from homeschoolers I've met who um, live in rural communities. And so I, I think without getting into that too much, I think there's definitely some opportunities to kind of unpack that and develop more of a systematic understanding. And I think one of our participants mentioned some international, uh, possible international differences. And so that would be great. I think uh, the literature on, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not too aware of the literature on how cultural capital varies across international contexts, but I don't think there, there's anything that exists on international context plus homeschooling, which I think would be interesting to look at as well. Well, great, Dan. Those are, those are great um, research ideas. Um, so everyone, you know, pick up your Pierre Bourdieu and, um, I, I don't know, Leroux and whoever else writes on, on him. Uh, well, hold on. Up. Um, oh. Hold on. But if, you're, if, if, if you are going to read Bourdieu, make sure you read DiMaggio and some of the people who have come later because they've, 
they've kind of moderated, right? So Pierre, Pierre Bourdieu, importantly, kind of, kind of postulated some of these ideas about what culture capital is. And then people have done empirical research have kind of weighed in and modified that, that theory. Ah, uh -huh. so he had some ideas about what it, culture capital is, but I think some empiricists have put some of those ideas to the test. Yeah. And, and uh, so anyway, read the, don't just read Bourdieu is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, I, I think these are all fabulous ideas. Thank you, Dan, for your presentation. Um, great job, and I, and I hope this was, uh, you know, very informative and, and helpful for folks. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I want to just um, uh, leave off with a, a couple just things to end here. Um, one, I'm, you know, there's a ton of comments in the chat um, that's, that's fascinating to read, um, uh, and, and I guess folks are trying to figure out how to save this. I, I think uh, certainly I'm able to save it, so maybe the um, we panelists might be able to save it. Deborah, maybe if you could just save it and um, email it out. To folks, um, uh, you know, it's not quite the same as a uh, uh, meeting face to face, but um, certainly we have a, a record here and lots of um, interesting comments to, to dig into some more. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I think with with Dan's research, um, I think it does raise a lot more questions, and I hope this has piqued some um, ideas for for research. Um, you know, thinking about homeschoolers and cultural capital, how might that vary? even within the homeschool population across countries, across contexts. Um, uh, and finally, um, I'll, I'll make sure to send uh, Dan's paper to Deborah, and Deborah will forward it to, um, to everybody um, so you can have access to it. Um, and uh, I believe Deborah has, again, there's, there's a brief poll or survey at the end. Um, if you'd be so kind to, to complete that, that'll help um, us. Uh, you know, we, we want your feedback so we know how to craft this thing as we go forward. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Deborah. I don't know if you have any other um, parting comments or announcements. Yes, thanks everybody for attending. And uh, we've got, we'll go back to um, our committee and we'll be getting back to you with what our plans are going forward. We certainly are gonna continue. There's a poll as you exit, feel free to uh, follow up with email to me uh, if, if you want to uh, you know, weigh in. Um, and you'll be hearing from us shortly. So thank you so much um, for your attendance today. Uh, we will not be sharing everybody's contact information without their permission. And I think that's in the survey as you leave. There should be a survey that uh, pops up as you leave to um, let us know if how you would like to uh, be reached going forward. Any yep, further you can pick more than one option on the poll. In terms okay. of what is your interest in homeschooling, everyone can vote. You can pick more than one thing. So you can be a homeschooling parent and a homeschooling researcher and a graduate of homeschooling all at the same time. Uh, I think there may be at least one person here who is that. I, anyway, and uh, also please, as Deb said, we really need you to fill in the survey so we can know what you're interested in hearing about in the future. There was one thing that I want to propose, and maybe some of you will be interested in this, but you can let us know in the survey. Yeah, you know, the impact yeah. of the COVID-19 pandemic on homeschooling, I think that's very timely and relevant. So that might be a topic if people are interested. Anyway, thanks, Albert, Dan, Deb, thanks for hosting. Yeah, just real quick, Mike, I, um, you know, I, 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 is the, um, I don't know if it's just me or I'm seeing some questions in chat about um, not being able to access the survey. Um, the poll, there's a poll right now. The survey will come. Oh, the survey's coming either, after. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, the survey. Yeah, there's the post. The post. Um, you know, webinar survey will come either when they click out of the webinar window or in an email follow-up, which will come shortly after. All right. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you Thank so you. much, Dan and Albert. Uh, Dan, that was exceptional. You you definitely uh, set the standard that we all want to uh, achieve. This is the kind of presentation we want to have at our GHEX conferences uh, and any virtual conferences. I think uh, that this is a way that we can, uh, those of us who care about homeschool research and just wanting to uh, have produce research that's uh, respected and accepted, uh, you uh, couldn't have done a better job of kind of leading us off here with our inaugural event and uh thank you so much for your time well thank you that's very kind of you i'm glad i could be helpful in that way good 
All right, everybody, thanks. And uh, you'll, we'll probably be sending out an invite to uh, our next meeting uh, very shortly. Thank you. Have a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy.